So good evening. This is the Finance Committee meeting for Tuesday, March 9, 2021. So why don't we do a roll call for the FinCom. Okay, Sandy Pipers, Finance Committee. Good uh, evening. Uh, Dick Vandenberg, Finance Committee. Helen Morton, Finance Committee. Good evening, Howard D'Amico, Finance Committee. Mike Hutner from the Finance Committee. And is that everyone? Um, that's Dr. Fitzpatrick, Matt, and... I've got a glare on the left middle. That's Matt, right? Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so why don't we have the police department come up, please? Do you have a copy, Howard? I don't. Well, I may have a problem. I want to give you a color copy. Appreciate it. Go. Good evening, everyone. You want one of the other chairs? No. <laughs> this is perfect. All right. Um, my name is Nick Miglianico. I'm the chief of police. I think I know everybody here and have met everybody before. This is Lieutenant Travis Gould. He was appointed uh, lieutenant in December. He replaced Lieutenant Dave Brown, who retired last year. Okay. So, welcome. Welcome. So, I emailed out the budget, and we can go over this. What I uh, gave to Gene, I believe, is what you have, and that's what we just handed out. I'll give you a quick rundown on the police department personnel. So our administration, part of the police department, um, is myself and the lieutenant. We take care of the day-to-day -day administrative operations of the police department. Then for our command staff, we have a detective sergeant, and we have three patrol sergeants. Uh, we have nine full-time patrol officers, four full-time dispatchers, five reserve um, officers, which are part-time officers, and seven part-time per diem dispatchers. So our total staff is 19 full-time personnel with 12 part-time personnel for a total of 31 employees. How is that compared to other years total? That is the same, uh, plus minus a few part-timers, depending on how many we're carrying. We can carry as many part-timers as we can have trained because they're on a per diem basis, so they don't cost us any money unless they work. So um, full-time, uh, we have an added on, I want to say close to eight years in eight positions, at least. So we're at 15 full-time. Um, officers and four full-time dispatchers. So we've been at that number for quite a while. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as I know, we always have questions when we talk about cruisers for the police department. The police, de <laughs> yeah. So the police department's budget is basically three categories. We have our personnel, our expenses, and our cruisers. So our cruiser fleet right now, we have three unmarked administrative cruisers. One is a 2019, one's a 2020, and one's a 2015 that um, the detective drives. We have five marked patrol cars that are driven around the clock. They're spread out between the nine patrol officers and the supervisors. So those five cars are what we call our five main line cars. So they're rotated in and out per shift. We assign officers, depending on what their schedule is, we try and pair them up. So they'll run a shift, run a day shift. If they run a day shift, we try and let it sit three to 11, and then maybe it gets operated on the overnight shift, depending. But those five cruisers are our line cars that are running all the time. Um, we also have two unmarked cruisers. When we did the uh, changeover a couple of years and we bought the new cruisers, we kept two that had over 100,000 miles on them. They weren't in any shape to, to run around the clock, but they were still in good enough shape where we weren't going to get a whole lot of money on the trade-in for them, so we kept them. So one, one is used by the canine officer. We put a, a, a canine transport um, in the back of that car, so he uses that car, he transports the dog, and he'll use it when he's here at work. The other one can be used for, say we have a detail um, and the detail requests a cruiser instead of taking a line car out or if somebody has to go to court They can go to court. We have an officer who's on the Semlec drone unit So he's on call on his days off so he can take that car uh, If he gets called out he has a cruiser to get to the call so um, Those were two that we kept like I said We weren't going to make any money on them. We had the equipment in on them. We could run them 
periodically, and um, that's worked out well for us. So as far as cruisers go, um, I'll jump ahead a little bit. Um, you'll see that there's no request for cruisers in this budget. Um, several years ago when Chief Foley was here, when we first started doing the cruisers and we increased the fleet, we used to lease the cars. We moved away from that. We got on a cycle where we would do two, two, and two. Um, replace two in one year, two the following year, and then two in the third year. That would replace the fleet. A couple of years ago, we had one that got involved in an accident. It got totaled out, and the way it was with the money that we had in the budget, we thought, it, and they were, Ford was transferring over to the um, hybrids, so it was a good time for us to, we had one that was replaced by the insurance company, so we were able to do three and three. Long story short, we have three 2018s now and three 2019s, and we don't have to look at starting that cycle of replacing cruisers again until FY 2024. So nothing this year, nothing next year. FY 2024 will come in with a request to start transferring out two cruises per year over that next three years. So FY 24, 25, and 26. Okay. Um, so moving into our, our salary side of the budget. On the salary side of the budget, we have eight line item accounts. Seven of those accounts are contract driven, which basically means that all of them are regulated by contracts. Um, Full-time patrolmen, um, educational incentive, rental wages, longevity wages. The only thing in that line item account that's not contract driven is the part-time wages. The part-time wages, we use our part-time per diem uh, people to fill in for dispatch vacation time, um, holidays, sick time, open scheduled shift is about eight shifts a month, the way the rotation works on the schedule, we, we know that we have to fill at least eight part-time dispatch shifts a month. We also use some of our, one of our full-time patrol, uh, full-time dispatchers is also a part-time patrolman. So instead of using overtime, if we have an open shift on patrol and that dispatcher's work and I can take him, put him on patrol, which saves eight hours of overtime and I can fill his shift with a part-time um, dispatcher. So we get bigger bang for our buck, two for one. Um, Does that happen much? It happens quite often. It, it actually happens a lot. We get a lot of our uh, out of our part-time people and it goes a long way. You look at our, our overtime account, overtime in public safety is, it's you know, it's a necessary evil. You're going to have it no matter what you do when you're 24-7. Things that create overtime is open shifts, either vacation time, holiday time, sick time, where we can't fill it with a part-timer, then it has to go to overtime. If we can fill it with a part-timer, we're saving a lot of money. So we, we do save a lot of money in the overtime account by using um, the part-time officers. But in the overtime, you either have court time, you have something comes up at the end of the shift where the officer ends up staying over because he's got to take care of what he was dealing with when it, when it happened. Um, so the overtime um, for a department our size, if we weren't able to use the part-timers and we didn't have this money, would probably be double what it is, close to double. And in addition to this 59.8 that I have in here for the um, part-time wages, we also the past couple of years have been able to get a grant from State 911, which gives us about another $30,000. The only problem with that is I can't figure that into the budget because they usually do not release that grant until end of May, early June, and it's never a guarantee. We've been lucky the past couple of years because it comes out and we do end up getting it, but you still have to budget these part-time shifts simply in case something happens with the state and they don't issue it. So having said that, our a total for our eight accounts and our salaries equals 1,627,243. And I have all the accounts listed on page three. How much more is that from a year ago, percent-wise? Uh, the total I can give you, I believe it's right around 2.5%. Uh, 
it's going to show a number of about $36,248. And if you compare it to last year, you'll see, oh, I see. Okay. in the full-time wages, because we've had some movement um, in personnel, the full-time wages is actually down a little bit, mm -hmm. almost about $26,000. You'll see in the salary account there's uh, uh, quite a bit of an increase simply because last year we anticipated that the state was going to be short on funds on local aid. So with the lieutenant retiring, we didn't fully fund that position um, for the whole year. We waited six months. So a large, a large part of that increase out of that 36,000 is that we fully funded the lieutenant's position. So. We had to pay the lieutenant out for his time until September. We didn't fill it until late this December, but it wasn't fully funded. So that's a lot of that. Did that bump the overtime up, not having the lieutenant? Um, it didn't really because he was in an administrative slot, so and he was working an administrative schedule. And his replacement, we didn't fill his position until December. And his replacement, because we were going to promote from within, basically opened up a uh, patrolman's position because everybody bumped up a spot. So the lieutenant now was a sergeant. He bumped up. We promoted a sergeant. And then we hired a new patrolman. So we're saving some money there. Chief. Yes. On the educational incentive section, 51410, mm -hmm. 66,000. Are those numbers in addition to the numbers listed at 51110, the previous page, full-time wages? Yes. Right? So, yes, that's a completely separate category. So, um, in the contract, if someone has a master's degree, it, and this goes back to the old Quinn bill, and I don't know if you're yeah, familiar right, with that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm so, Yep. Back in the day, they used to have, uh, there was Mass General Law, which they called the Quinn Bill, and, and police officers, towns that accepted it would get a certain percentage of their base pay. It's, I think it was 10, 20, and 25 for a master's degree. So 10 for an associate's, 20 for a bachelor's, and 25% on top of their base pay. The state would pay half, and the town would pay half. When um, the recession hit, the state decided, you know, we're not, we're going to bail out. We've got to cut some money somewhere. We're not going to pay our half of the Quinn bill. So towns started going, instead of the Quinn bill, they started going to educational incentives. So that's when uh, this was negotiated into the contract. So it was an educational incentive based on what the town's half of the percentage would be, and they came up with specific numbers. So our guys, anybody in the police department who has an um, associate's degree gets a $4,000 benefit. Anyone who has a bachelor's degree gets a $7,000 benefit. Anybody with a master's degree gets a, a $10,000 benefit on top of their base pay. And that's eligible today forward for any of them also, right? To right. So any any new officers degrees. coming in, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the salaries? Anybody? So, Carol? Anybody? Chief? Yes. Last year's budget, you had a $7,500 stipend. Did you do away with that? Yes, for the accreditation? Yes. Yeah, last year's budget. You paid that. That's the cash bonus? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, last year's budget also consisted of a one time $7,500 payment for each officer got a $500 uh, bonus because we achieved accreditation through the state um, accreditation commission. And that's withdrawn this time. It was a one-time amount. Well, I will tell you, for me at least, I like the way this was presented tonight. This was just not a ton of information, but well presented and readable, easy to understand. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Good. Thank it you. Helps. It helps. Yeah. Thank you. I have, a, I have one more question. So other than a couple of years down the road cruisers, mm -hmm. do you see anything else looking forward that is a potential concern for really raising your budget? Um, I've been talking with the town administrator. We've been figuring out 
Next year, we want to um, replace trade in and replace our weapons, which we do about every six or seven years, simply because that's the, the time frame on them, uh, the, the end of life, they say. Um, so we've been looking at that, whether it's going to stay in capital or whether we're going to put it into the budget. So that would be an expense that could go up to, I would say, between twenty-three and $25,000, depending. We get a good amount for the trade-ins. We trade in these, but um, that's just a quick estimate, and we would be looking to do that probably next year. Uh, I think at some point, right now, we're in good shape, uh, but at some point, we're going to have to start looking at when we're going to add another patrolman or two patrolmen. I think a department our size with the town our size, the town's growing, there's some businesses coming in. Um, to adequately staff our shifts, we may need to look at hiring one or, more, one or two more patrolmen. In addition to that, I talked about how we use our part-timers. Right now with the police reform bill, there's a lot of changes going on and we're not really sure ourselves what's going to happen. Um, with the training, as far as it comes to the part-timers, we have some part-timers now, but there's there's no new part-time academy scheduled. Uh, there's a question about their certifications, what's going to happen with their certifications when they expire, are they going to do some bridge training, so um, we're still waiting to see how that that's going to unfold. However, I can say for this year, um, with the amount of people that we have, I, I think we're adequately staffed. But again, you know, it's been eight to nine years since we've added actual any positions. The town's growing. Um, it's been a, you know, a, a fairly busy year, with, even with COVID. Um, but you know, some things have slowed down. Obviously, court time is is down because the courts have been closed, um, bars have been closed. <laughs> people, yeah. you know, we had the yeah. curfew there for for right. many months where people weren't allowed out. So um, there's going to come a time over the next couple of years. I think we're going to have the serious conversation at looking at um, adding a couple of people. How about how about your building, the facility? Is that adequate? The facility is has been on capital for many years now. It still is. Um, we've done a lot of renovations to the building um, over the past three years. We've upgraded the floors. We, you know, did a lot of painting. Uh, we're in good. Sh the the building's in decent shape. Uh, you know, I would refer that to. We can get by. It's. I mean, it would be great to have a new station, but you're talking eight million dollars. Um, it's a lot of money. I mean, I mean, I would love to see one. I would love to see a state-of-the-art facility like Sutton just built. It's it's beautiful. Um, you know, the reality is, um, we can get by with what we have. We would love to have a new place, but frankly, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I have a question about part-timers. The way you get them in is by just having them go to a part-time academy. Yeah, there is a part-time academy. There's a full-time academy and a part-time academy. The part-time academy now is about, well, before they made the changes, was about 380 hours. They would go two or three nights a week for probably six months. They would graduate from that. We would give them field training. They would go through our field training program. Most of our part-time people are cross-trained, so they can work dispatch and they can work the road. So. We get, you know, dual use out of them. They can work either the desk or the road. Um, but yeah, that's the way it was, and we have several part timers now. But uh, they're not sure what they're going to do with the training, so that could limit us doing that in the future. And we've always hired from within. Everybody that we've hired, we started out with us part time, and it's worked great for us. It's been a great feeder system. Everybody that we've had has worked here part-time and we invest in them. If, if they do a good job when we have them part-time and their goal is to be a full-time officer, I would rather invest in somebody that's already here, mm -hmm. send them to the full-time academy. They've paid their dues, they've proven to us what they can do and what their work ethic is. It, it goes a long way. So I, frankly, I hope it doesn't change. I hope they do figure something out so we can keep doing things like that um, because it's worked out well for us. Mm -hmm. 
seems it seems like it would be great to get more part timers on when you get the overtime down. Maybe yeah, no, I, I would agree. We're always looking for good people. We have people that. You know, we'll stop in, send resumes. If they have the proper certification, the lieutenant and I will meet with them. If if we think that they're going to be a benefit to the department and they're they're looking to, you know, get on the job full time, um, we certainly take a look at them. So, if, if that part time academy does open up and it is allowed, will you look at getting more part timers in then? Definitely, definitely. Great. Okay. So, if there's no other questions, that's basically our salary side. And we move over to the expense side. As you can see, they're all line itemed out. Um, there's 27 individual line items in in that account. Um, the total for everything within the expenses is 162195, which is up about $9,997 from last year. Now, just I play with these accounts every year. Um, I go back over the past two to three years and I try and tweak them to get them exactly where they need to be. Of all these accounts and the incre increase of the $9,000 or $9,997, 6000 of it is I have two new people. I have two new people this year. They're very young and I know they're going to use the tuition reimbursement to finish out their degrees. So that's a $6,000 increase right there contractually. I also increased the, the training uh, by 3200 because I'm anticipating uh, a retirement in May and I'm going to want to fill that position. So there's a potential if I don't have somebody who's full-time academy trained that I would have to send them to the full-time academy which costs about $3,000. And on top of that, every one of our officers uh, requires at least 40 hours of training. We try and do most of that um, online through the MPTC, which doesn't cost us much, but we have specialized training that guys need to keep their certification up in. Um, so it seems like a lot of money, but for 15 full-time people, it doesn't go a long way. Some of these classes can be 250 to $500, depending on what the certification is. So just simply with those two accounts, and and tweaking all these other accounts. Out of the 27 accounts, really two, ac two accounts account for $9,000, $9,200 of that increase and all of the other 25 accounts is simply like $797. It's small increments. And like I said, I moved some money around in each account. You know, for example, I went back and looked at what we're paying for fuel over the past uh, eight months and then what we paid last year. Uh, the fuel always gets me nervous because you, you never know where it's going to go. I don't want to take too much out of that account, but um, you know, the bottom line is that end number, um, which I think we can live with um, that I have here. Chief, is that fuel number about what it was for the previous year? Yeah, actually, so the fuel number is actually only down, I only decreased by like $1,598. So it was up over a little, thir a little over $30,000 last year. And the pace that we're on right now, we started out really good. I was down to like 180 something a gallon. And now it's starting to, to get up there towards the 230 mark. Um, what happens in a year if just to that point, right, it's March now, this isn't even, you know, this is a budget starting in July, mm -hmm. and you can see that number trending. You could you could blow up 50%, yep. right, from a 180 and to 270 is 50%. How do you get those funds if that happens? So, again, all of these accounts, even though they're line itemed out, really the bottom line number is what's important. Mm -hmm. So we start watching the fuel. So if, if the fuel's ticking up, and I'm in July, and it, it's getting up there and I'm spending more than I normally do, we hold off on other things. I won't order ammunition until the end of the year for, for training. Some of, the, some of the big ticket items. We will put some things off to make sure that we have enough money for the fuel and what's anticipated. And, you know, maybe we don't, you know, have the, the cleaners come in and, and clean the bathrooms every week. You know, whatever you got to do to 
to make this bottom number work. To a point. You, you, right, you do. So there's. Gene, can, can the department come before like a fall town meeting for a um, specific authorization in the yeah. event you have that big a swing that you're starting to draw from too many of the other, other right. categories? I had already asked the chief about this, the Springtown meeting. Um, and you will see an increase in the salaries because of some overtime issues. We have to increase his wage line. So he watches it to the best of his ability. But if it's something that he cannot make up, then we would put him on the right. Springtown meeting. OK. Yep. OK. He's very good about his budget. No, it's just, you know, I can see that number trending. And it's a ways away. Yeah for that number to go up. Right, and we, and, and the way we look at it is we track it by, I track it by gallons every month, so we get it all, you know, what we're spending, what we're paying per gallon, what we're averaging for the whole month. But it, you're right, it is tricky, and that, that's, out of all of these, that's probably the line item that concerns me the most with the... That's the that snow could, and ice budget. Right, it, that's, that's my snow and ice. That's your, that's your yeah. best item. That's yeah. Kind of yeah. I mean, the yeah. ignition did go up yeah. for a while yeah. there, too, yeah. but that's your risk item. That, okay, that's, okay. Yeah, so. and, and like I said, over the years, we tweak these accounts and we get them very close to where they should be. It, it's kind of like a game. Sure, I got it. <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, I get it. Again, at the end of the day, it's the bottom line number, and if we can stay within that, um, you know, we're in good shape. Okay. Um, again, if you look at the last page, page uh, five, there is no cruisers. We're not even going to talk about those till 2024. Um, and then even when we get to that, it would be two, two, and two. Um, just an estimated number uh, the last time we bought a car. We try and go when we buy cars. Last time we bought cars, we upfitted them with all new equipment. And we did that because of the equipment we had in the other cars weren't going to fit into these new model cars. The way the industry works, you can probably get two turnovers with that equipment that you buy before they change the specs and you have to buy a new car and you have to buy all new equipment. So when we do to uh, trade those two cars in, We'll be able to, if all goes as planned, and the way the cycle usually works, we'll be able to take the new gear that we bought out of for those last for that last round, and move them into this round, which again saves us some money. We're not just trading the car in with all the gear. We're changing over the lights, the siren box, the control switches, all that stuff, the radios, um, the flux capacitor, all of it. Right? <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> and that's. You know, basically the, the police department's budget in a, a nutshell, it's not that difficult. Like I said, um, usually three categories. Everything else that we get, any grants that come up, we obviously apply for. We're, we've been fortunate to get those 911 grants. Um, they help out tremendously. Um, we have, right now we have a um, municipal road safety grant which pays for overtime for extra patrols, OUI patrols, seatbelt patrols. And in addition, this year we were able to get, um, as part of that grant, brand new LIDAR and two handheld radars, um, all at no cost to the town. So, been beneficial. Chief, do, do the other services and the other supplies, that's $16,000, those mm -hmm. two, is that kind, kind of wiggle roomy? Categories or yes, so uh, does that give you a little bit of hedging if if you need it? Yeah, it does, and I I got the uh, so other services we have um, some cleaning services we have um, you know our carpet for the our rug for the lobby in, in the on the back hall that that gets changed out every week by Sintas. There's there's stuff like that if uh, a cruiser was um, exposed to bodily fluids or whatever. We, there's a company, New England Trauma, that needs to come out and if there's an incident in the cell, we have to have them specially clean. Okay. Those types of services that, you know, you budget for and, but if you had to, like I was telling Howard, like if, if we're in the last two months and we're like, oh, this budget is really tight and we're not gonna be able to come for a town meeting, if you have to cut some things, you, you cut some things. You don't have the bathrooms clean for a couple of weeks, we do it. <laughs> you know, but it saves you 125 bucks, well, you know. And coming before the town. Right. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're close. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Okay. This is Jim. Well, Matt. Yes, Matt. Uh, with respect to fuel, uh, just remember that between gasoline and heating fuel, we'll probably spend, well, we're, we're budgeted presently for about $140,000, $145,000. Um, I'm going to increase that town-wide because I just think it is very reasonable to assume that we're going to see a 15 to 20 percent increase in the price of all of our fuels. Mm -hmm. It's a function of a policy-driven increase um, <clears throat> in different administration in Washington, different priorities, and pent-up demand, especially on the gasoline side. Yeah. But once people are able to move around again, they're going to go, start going places and there'll be a demand factor in, on the cost of gasoline. Um, so it's only X amount in Chief Miglianico's budget. It's a big amount for the town budget. So I think getting down to the wire here, that's a judgment call. I, I would rather err on the side of being conservative. Um, I have only one question for the Chief. You have a line item on your expenses for uniforms, which is a change from past years too, is there, did you decide to do something different? Yeah, and the reason that's on there is um, I anticipate um, a retirement in May. So my um, plan would be to, if I had to send somebody to the academy, I would, I would do that after July 1st. However, either way, w whether I have somebody who's academy trained or has to go to the academy, we're going to have to buy those uniforms. They get an initial is issue of uniforms, so that's why that two thousand dollars was put in there. Okay. Which would be different from the, the initial issue clothing is different from the clothing allowance that the officers that are already on receive sure. yearly. So it's just the initial setup. Matt, does that answer your question? It does. Um, the only other thing I'd remind everyone. Um, this union is in negotiations with us. So um, this is a really solid and very detailed budget at this point, but it is subject to change as we negotiate with the collective bargaining unit. For this fall, for this coming fiscal yes, year, yeah, that's they're, still they're, in flux? Yeah, their current con the current contract that these numbers are based on expires June 30th, and they are in negotiations now with the town, the union is. Okay, these numbers are based on the current contract. Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Chief. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions or concerns at any point, just shoot me an email. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. We have five minutes. Doctor, are you ready a little early? Absolutely. Welcome tonight. We're glad to we're glad to see you. Well, I, <laughs> you were you were kind enough to alert me that I should anticipate seven forty five, but I thought given the inability to connect last time that I, I would shorten any gap between the police presentation and the Blackstone Valley Tech presentation. We appreciate it. So. Thank you very much. So if you would like, do we have any other materials or, okay, there you go. Look at that. Go ahead, doctor. You know, I trust that the committee is aware with Jeannie's request that a number of documents have been forwarded, but the first couple of things I wanted to share uh, allow you to capture some of the things that are happening at, at your vocational school campus. Uh, Jenna, can we advance? There's, the, the building is currently 60 years old, but we make a concerted effort to make improvements, and we try to make those improvements without asking the towns to pay for capital uh, requests. In fact, the FY22 budget has no uh, capital items in it once again. One of the major changes we were able to make uh, is the biotechnology program. Jenna, can we advance, please? In this situation, you see a major uh, on-campus renovation of uh, biotech laboratories made possible by a, a, a grant, a competitive grant, of 835000 from the Governor's Capital Skills Trust. So this is, um, these are renovations that we were able to uh, make 
uh, some with our own staff, but not all of them with our own staff because of the nature of the grant. And you can see the sophistication uh, and the ability to offer this, uh, this program to Douglas and the students of the other 12 communities. Another example of improvements made without asking the town for money is the self-funding of the roof projects. It, we are in the process um, of wrapping up the fourth of four uh, roof, uh, actually it'll take five all total, but this is the fourth leg of the roof improvement uh, effort, uh, reimbursed at 55.5% through the Mass School Building Authority. And so this gives you a snapshot of that. We self-funded this project. Uh, we did not ask the towns to assume any additional debt in order to do it. Um, and these are examples, you know, of, uh, I, I hope they display the cost-effective approach. I know that anytime you're requesting a dollar, it's not really popular, but uh, we, we want you to know that we protect your investment, we continue to make improvements in your investment, uh, and do, so, do that whenever possible with money that we acquire from outside of the assessments of the town. Chairman, do we have any additional documents? Oh yes, we wanted to, I know there's been conversations about sample fundraising efforts. Uh, this is just the sample. We do uh, anything from golf tournaments to gourmet dinners, the programs themselves, and for example, the painting and design program uh, was able to generate additional money uh, attributable to the COVID preparation of signage. Uh, that was used uh, in other schools uh, in other settings. We provided uh, a summary of, bef uh, actually the budget was after a public hearing last Thursday, uh, the school committee just authorized for the budget. Uh, so we're, you know, we're right uh, on the cusp of that development. Uh, but we, I previously provided the um, estimate sheet and the uh, predictable sheet to be helpful to Matt and, and the, certainly the Finance Committee and the Board of Select Persons uh, for the town warrant. And so this highlighted uh, the key numbers. Um, on the right hand side here, I noticed it says an increase of FY21 of 124,888. That is the increase to the absolute minimum obligation uh, component of the increase. And there, there's a display of the total request. I don't believe, General, I don't believe we have additional documents, but we have provided them to you. Is uh, how, as you know, you have traditionally asked for greater insight than uh, relative to uh, the graduation plans of the students. Uh, in today's environment, we do find that the vast majority of our students prefer to pursue uh, further education before entering the workforce. Interestingly enough, two Saturdays ago, I met with one of the key central mass people for apprenticeship programs, and he indicated to me that he wanted to expand the apprenticeship options, but in so doing, uh, he was offering a one-third tuition to Wentworth. So even the apprenticeship programs continue to encourage and reward uh, and make it very attractive for our graduates to pursue further education before they enter the workforce. Also, I mentioned uh, that our annual report printed by our students that was previously provided although if anybody needs an additional copy, we'll get it to you, uh, details uh, a, a several year trend of the placement of students. So there's a wide variety of uh, college affiliations and also the fact that the, the students, because of the combination of trade uh, and academic work, have been very successful in securing, uh, you know, a significant amount of uh, tuition, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, offsets uh, in the form of scholarships. And so we, we're glad to share that. We're very proud, of course, of the Douglas students there, um, and, um, and the success that they've encountered and earned within our institution. Jim, do we have anything else or the others uh, uh, pretty much answers that's to the it. question? Yeah. That's, that's it for us, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if I may, how of course, I'll take this in any direction you'd like. I know there were questions uh, that were raised relative to health benefits, and this has been a uh, priority for, for the town manager as well. Um, we did incur a significant uh, health uh, insurance increase last year, but fortunately we did not have that going into FY22. 
Uh, as, according, as you'll know, I'm going to see, or if you have not yet seen, the documents that were forwarded, um, the primary health insurance providers have a pilgrim. Uh, we have two, two providers, uh, and the insurance is uh, pretty much a 75-25% contributory rate process. They were 90-10 uh, when I arrived at Valley Tech some years ago. But in any case, the major provider is Harvard Pilgrim, and they have committed themselves to a less than a 2.1 uh, premium increase, 2.06. Uh, and this week, they notified us that the, the so-called catastrophic cases or the, the, the medical uh, situations that are more costly are trending uh, even better than they were for the, that brought or resulted in the 2.06 increase. So that, that creates added optimism moving forward. But what built into the budget is uh, the health benefit cost uh, for the major provider, uh, which was one of the questions that was asked of, of us. Um, other, other, other questions? I know that we've, we've provided the um, standard copy of, of the budget. I'm not sure just in the COVID environment, if the people have their hands on things or they're still you know, yet to be uh, you know, reviewed. Uh, I have yet to do the website presentation, but I will do that, uh, I'm expecting to do that tomorrow, uh, given the fact that our budget was just voted last Thursday. And, and so that will also be available. I also will anticipate, um, as I have, as you well know, uh, zooming in to the uh, town meeting uh, in uh, May 3rd, I think. Are there any questions uh, in general? Yeah, Dr. Fitzpatrick, I'm looking at the documents that were forwarded us, and it looks like the total member assessment is about 4.4% increase. Is that correct? The total budget increase is 3.1. Um, but, but where it says total member assessment, it says 4. Point. Across 13 pounds? Uh, I can tell you this, that one of the things we're witnessing is that the, the way the state does the financing, that the burden to the towns is about 60% of the budget and the state aid is about 40% of the budget. Is that helpful as far as the general picture? But the total budget increase is 3.1. Uh, it's not shared equally across the 13 towns because of the way in which the state does the calculations of property values and uh, income values yeah. on a town by town basis. Yeah, so I was wondering, yeah, very helpful. I was wondering when you were working on the budget, did you have various scenarios you were practicing, like a 1%, a 2%, a 3%, or did you kind of look what your needs were and it happened to be about 3%? How did you, how did you do your uh, scenarios? Well, it's a case of challenging the people who present their requests to us. <laughs> Uh, the budget process started in, you know, in November, uh, and we, we regularly, as you, we function sort of as a finance committee, uh, hearing the request from the principals or academic coordinators or special ed directors, uh, and we challenge them to find alternative ways to acquire the resource. Uh, the budget book will detail uh, the, you know, more than $2.7 million in grants. Uh, we're we're, we're going to go right by the three million mark, I think, which was a high water mark for us last year. So we, by securing additional grants, we could um, remove some things. Uh, by challenging people to um, find alternative ways uh, to make certain students weren't hurt, uh, and, and educational quality didn't suffer. Uh, the end result was the 3.1. Again, does that a, that respond to your question? Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I ask, if I may, Matt, you you have the numbers for for your planning purposes? Yeah, I do. Okay, fine. So it looks like an eleven point. Scrolling between two screens, it's a whole new skill. <laughs> 11.22% year over year. I have a 10.7 change from last year um, to the new request. 
it, within the 3.1. I do have one other aspect I want to introduce at some point. Yeah, I just, so what I got from your document was 1539389, is that right? 1539389, that's correct. That is correct. That includes the uh, total operation. The debt is separate. There are four years remaining on the only debt, which was the expansion of the school. Yeah, the debt is 39116. So I've already. That's 100% right. Yes, sir. So my whiz bang Excel has that as an 11.122% increase for us year over year. That's slightly higher than my calculation, but uh, but the numbers are oh, matched. Uh, and that's the, but we could round both numbers to 11. So it's an 11 on top of a 12 on top of a 6 on top of a 28. With an increase in students. Yeah. Most school systems in the state have a decrease in students. Right. Including us. Well, not to us. No, to us, we have an increase of two. Not to you. That's okay. Yeah. My question, um, while I've got the floor, Mr. Chairman, if I may? Sure. Uh, could I just inquire of what is your monthly premium for your retiree plan? or a, a representative retirement. retirement. That, that, yeah. um, they were detailed in the information sheet that we advanced. Uh, no, not the premium oh. number, that's what I'm asking for. I, I saw the rate of increase. Okay. You can see, I'm looking for the per member per month premium for a representative plan. I think you're, you've got like 12 plans that you're offering retirees, so I don't want you to do all that math. I'm just curious, even if I do upper bound, lower bound. Okay, as a non-retiree, I don't know that one off the top of my head, but I'll get it for you. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm at, why I'm asking. Because uh, we've, we've gone out to market and gotten a very favorable rate. So for fiscal 22, our per member per month retiree through Edna is 288.60. Mm -hmm. That is a bookable rate, so our health plan can offer that to the school district if you, if, maybe not this year, but when you next go to open enrollment and you can make a switch. I, I doubt that you've got 288.60. I bet you you're in the 300s. Okay. As I mentioned to you when you first alerted me of your exploration in this area, I'm, you know, be more than happy to investigate options of partnership. Um, the teachers usually find themselves in the group of training but, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's part of what, what I inherited. That was already in place before, you know, 27 years ago. It got, it got <laughs> okay. I think the difference, just for the record, is that we, we got a, our group to the point where we're a national account. So we got national bids in when we went out. So Edna cut us a, a far more favorable rate than they would have if we had been out just as the town of Douglas. So that's what I'm proud of is that Edna offered that as bookable. So we've signed up other communities to participate, not in our active plans, but in our retiree plans. And uh, so it's worked out for them. They've saved a lot of money joining us. And I just throw that out there as a, a way for you to reduce operational costs. I appreciate that. I, I will have someone reach out to you who uh, deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis, more so than myself, uh, to um, cadets. All right. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, my, how would I, if, if I may, the, the no. state has introduced um, a concept, but it's not yet uh, confirmed. And, and the concept that the state introduced was a, um, a one of, as the federal government uh, votes, I believe, tomorrow on a major stimulus package, uh, which I hope is helpful certainly to Douglas and, and all our communities as well as the schools. Um, but the state, through the governor's plan in Massachusetts, has introduced a, uh, a possible plan uh, of a, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, otherwise known as an ESSER II. Right? And it, the state has actually calculated 
exactly what the awards would be if this becomes a reality. In other words, the legislature has yet to take it up, so it's, it's, it's the usual handoff from the governor to determine whether or not the legislature also supports it. If that were true, or if that, if that becomes real, then Douglas would be uh, awarded, uh, if it requested, a, an amount of $7,503. That's 7, 503, so about 7,500, okay? Um, that um, could be used as, I'm gonna use the term a rebate of, of the FY22 assessment. Uh, so it's an option that may exist. The town can request it if it becomes real. I wanna make sure that you're aware that it's being, uh, you know, considered at the state level. Yeah. Michael, can I ask you, uh, you know that at least here in Douglas, the last few years we've asked you each year to come to us with a year-over-year -year increase that is no greater than our school's year-over-year -year increase. You said tonight your year over year for 22 is 3.1 over 21, correct? 3.1% increase? But the to our total budget is 3.1. But, but as I said, the, the state's absolute minimum obligation alone to, to Douglas, uh, which is a weight of about 82% of the assessment request that we're advancing, um, that's out of our hands. I mean, that's... Um, and that, that's one of the, I guess, variables where the state um, has significant impact on determining how the assessments are weighted, right? And no, I understand that, I, but you're, you're above that number. Your, your proposal is above that number. So I guess my question is, when you were coming up with your budget, back to Dick's question a little bit, did you take into account Douglas's concern that we were looking for you to have a year-over-year -year increase that was much closer to what Douglas was historically doing in the last few years? Or I guess I could ask you a broader question. Is your year-over-year -year this year greater than each of the other 13 towns was last year? In other words, is the total assessment across 13 towns greater? No, your, 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 your fiscal 22 proposal tonight is a 3.1% increase over your same budget for last year, correct? That's, that is correct, yes. So my question is, in, in preparing what you needed and what you'd come to the, your, your 13 member towns with, did you look at what each of those towns increase was last year for their school? Well, well one of the differences I've attempted, yet in summary, yes, we, 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 we've noticed that in the sense of the, what, the reported request that colleagues have identified for our school systems, uh, for the 12 school systems, okay? Uh, and there's quite a range, okay? Um, and the, the point, though, that I, I've tried to emphasize, okay, is that if you're dealing with a K-12 town department school system, then you, you have been supportive of including, and, and this is true of all the nine K-12 systems, which we wish the very best to, it's not, all right, that they are able to request a number of items on the municipal side of the budget that are not counted in the request if you look at only the school system budget. In our case, that's not true. It's, it's, it includes all cost centers, okay? So that if, if we're looking for a tractor or a snow plowing or, you know, anything, it's in our budget because we, we don't have an ability to pull it out and ask a given, the 14th town, to say, will you pay for this for us from the municipal side? So it, it, it's not, it's, I've said it's an apples and orange, or even somebody once said to me, horseshoe and toothpick type comparison, right? If you look at Valley Tech's consolidated request with all cost centers versus a, a K through 12 town department request, plus or minus all, all of the additional requests that you find in the municipal side. And we wish the schools the very best in that, but I, 
I, am, am I am I sharing that point where you recognize what's in, what's not in? I understand that, but it's still a mathematical event. It's still a percentage event. So I guess my question still is, when you looked back at the 21 budgets for the 13 towns, did any of them have year over year, over year increases in their school departments from 2020 that was greater than your 3.1 request tonight? Did any if of the did any of the 13 the towns? Side, no, likely. no. Last year, uh, just the four, just the school departments, four of Mike. The, uh, communities uh, were um, were advancing overrides. Yeah, I understand so how that works too. For considerably greater amounts of money. We Michael, for that. I, I, I respect everything you're saying. I'm just asking you that question. Were any, right. and, and, and were, I'm saying that if you add the additional items to the municipal side, I would say that, that, that it, the comparisons are much more you know, relevant and much more equalized. But if you take all those municipal items out from, you know, then you don't have an ability to compare and contrast. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let me, let me I can go so far as to say to you, we do follow that, okay? Um, and we don't interfere with it, we do follow it. Um, and we ask, I mean, we have a dozen people who live in Douglas who work in our system. We, we obviously encourage them to be supportive of, of the local school system, which is in their community. Um, and we try to draw additional money, whether it be by self-funding. You wouldn't find the local school system self-funding a roof project or, or securing $3 million in grants. So it, it and, and we don't ask them to do that, okay? Um, but we, we're, we're able to do that because of the local appropriation that Douglas, uh, all 13 towns made to us last year and almost every year. I wish the requests were less, but this, you know, I, I, you know, we, we're running the system, uh, making improvements, protecting your investment, not asking, we never come back and said, oh, I need additional money. Um, I guess but the locals can do that. I got it. You could ask the polar between the teachers for the nothing. No, I, 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 it's a more macro question. I, I, I think Michael and I understand each other. <laughs> I do. Okay. Anyone else? How, how would, can you just a point the, sure. uh, I, I seek a more, you know, I guess, a more harmonious relationship, okay? And, and I, I strive for it, and I continue to strive for it. I, do you want to ask me what I'd like I, to see? What's that? Did you want to ask me what I would like to see as a good faith effort? Uh, Did you well, want to ask me that? that? Here's, here's what I would ask. <laughs> would, you, so. would you um, monitor the increases across the district that will be advanced in FY22? Right? I, you know, they'll be in the media. And I can, you know, I, it's pretty clear that in a number of cases they're going to be greater than 3.1. Okay? If I'm wrong about that, then I'll be surprised. Okay. What are your, That's point two. What are your student sports fees currently? What was that? What are your student sports fees, participation fees currently? They have an extracurricular activity fee, roughly $50, and then you have to raise money. And we raise more money through student services than systems acquire through fees. I don't know one kid that's come through our Douglas school system that hasn't been doing fundraising. So I, I think they're doing the same things. Maybe you think you're more successful. But your fee is still $50, Michael. And our fee is, is it still $200? It's up there. Right, in that range? And so that sticks in my craw. When I see kids not being able to participate in sports programs in the Douglas High School because their parents can't afford the fees, because we're sending more money to you so your kids have a lower fee cost, that's problematic. And that's problematic for our residents and our voters and our parents 
and our community. And that feels um, unjust in terms of you coming. Of you could make your request 3.05% and address labor, that disparity. The labor activities and sophistication of the, of the trades generates more money than, you know, than standard or typical fundraising efforts. Right. I cut you off. You were going to suggest something that would make our relationship more harmonious. <laughs> Go ahead. It's a mutual. It's a mutual request. I'm saying that I, I, the I've tried to explain that our request incorporates a lot of cost centers that are not traditionally advanced in, in a, a different budget or a local town budget. I don't seem to be able to, you know, pierce the, the, no, the thinking there. No, I You've that. you've pierced and, it. And it. I've it, got it. it. Created a disconnect because. No. And even in our budget, in the booklets that we provide, we detail all the cost centers that are incorporated, that are addressed with the request. Um, and we make no capital request to you. It, it, is, is, is that work? I mean, I, Michael, I mean, we appreciate, as, as a vendor providing us, we appreciate of, all that work. All of that is appreciated. That's not, that's not discredited. That's all appreciated. I don't want to get, give you the impression it's not. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing that. I'm, I'm telling you that all of those efforts and all that work and all that generation of self-sufficient revenue and building capital improvement is all appreciated by the town of Douglas and I presume by the other 12 towns. But that doesn't necessarily get us home. Well, right? Well. It's, it, it's an attempt to share, you know, how we manage the dollars that we request and how we maximize and complement them, okay? Right. And, and we're in a different situation. There's a regional vocational technical uh, system than uh, a K through 12 town department. Uh, we don't expect them to compete with us in that regard, all right? And they, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, I'm saying that when, when we raise $3 million, you know, we do that through additional effort, through additional lobbying, uh, through you know, going above and beyond to add to the comp to the dollars. All right, so that's an awful lot. Three million dollars from grants alone in, in this year so far. Okay, it's you know, you're kind of hoping that it's noticed. You know, as opposed, to, and these things are done with the, the students do some of the work uh, that allows us to use grant money to make improvements in the 60-year-old facility as opposed to charging them more fees. Michael, can I switch topics very quickly a little bit? Where are you currently in terms of in-person class and classes and learning? We have been um, in-person in since mid-August, okay? Uh, uh, and therefore, we don't have all but six, six days. We were out six days due to staffing, outside staff issues. Uh, other than that, we've been in person. 25% of the students have been in. We're going to switch to 50% uh, as now that the state has allowed us to do that within the safety protocols. So we have re we've been very fortunate in that regard. We've been able to remain in person um, almost in total. We also have 195 day teaching year, so it's a longer school year. I Does I'm that answer that. No, I'm, I, bear with me, I'm a little confused. When you say 25% in person, what are the other 75% doing each day? Are they remote? Are you, they're, are they're you? in remote learning, that's correct. Are the, kids, are the kids alternating a couple of days a week, a couple of days every, on those two week flips? That's correct, there's okay. an alternating process, but now 50% of the students will be in uh, starting on April 3rd. Fantastic, okay. Now we would, we would have more, uh, if, the, if the safety protocols allowed it, okay? In fact, the students, the students built separators out of plexiglass in their own design in the cafeteria that allowed us, uh, will allow us to have 50% of the students in. It's a design that the students came up with and we shared it with some of the other school systems across the state. For that, I thank our staff. Anyone else? Good. Doctor? Jenna? Okay. Jenny? Thank you very much. I'll see you at home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so I have a reserve fund transfer I'd like to address. So, Jean, what do you have here for us? Two thousand dollars. Can you walk us through this just yes, quickly? Yes, that is going to be used for advertising for the two positions we spoke about at the last FinCon meeting um, for the executive assistant and the I don't know what the new title will be. Um, the town engineer's former position, but whatever that title is going to be. Where are we with the town engineer uh, hiring? And the, and the, are we still in a Matt left? Is he coming in? He's coming to visit us? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> so whether he's coming or where we're at with the town Either engineer. Question, I don't know the answer to okay. Ta da! Good evening. Hello. It's easier to not hear myself, but <laughs> sure. I was able to work while the others were presenting. I heard you ask where we are with the town community development director posting. And the, what do we have? Uh, and that was posted today. Um, it's a big job, so it's not a simple advertisement. Yep. We're posting on all three Southern New England States Association of uh, professional planners websites that's where people with that background go to look and in the Worcester Telegram Gazette which you get electronic postings along with the posting in the newspaper I think I set March 29th or thereabouts as the date that the first round of resumes would be screened and interviewed so that's that's pretty much where we stand there. The Board of Selectmen approved the job description the last a week f back from today, last week, last Tuesday. So the earliest we could have posted was Wednesday. Suzanne was on vacation. She does a lot of the advertising accounts, and we needed the money from, from you guys. Now, I, the good news is I, uh, all the electronic postings, we found a way to get it all done for free. So all we're really paying for on this particular posting is the... Um, the newspaper. Sure. But we we know we're going to have some other vacancies. Um, if the process of posting internally for Suzanne's position is not successful in getting candidates, then we would have to post outside. We don't want to be hamstrung there. And at some point, I don't know exactly when, but we will be advertising for the principal assessor's position because she is retiring at the end of the year. So quite a long time from now and maybe next fiscal year. But what we've talked to her about is uh, the same kind of transition process as there would be with Suzanne, where if somebody came in new, they would have a good four to six weeks with the incumbent to really get a feel for the job here in Douglas. Uh, these these nice transitions are, are much more uh, effective for us as an organization and we don't lose a step so we would have to advertise and then we'd probably come back I'm actually going to budget for that overlap in Beth's position because that is next fiscal year when, when it will actually be vacant so that's who's handling we, that stuff now Matt the top engineer stuff so we have your last reserve fund transfer went to hire Ian McElwee from CMRPC, who gives us eight hours a week. And we're in, you know, constant communication to make sure that that allocation of staff time is, is enough for the planning board to go through its agenda. So I'm keeping an eye on what they have. If it's A and R's, you know, I'm not going to worry too much. No. If a big subdivision comes in and there's a lot of uh, upfront work, then we'll make sure um, Ian has the time, and if he doesn't, would we'd ask the planning board to work with us to hire someone out. Right now, I don't foresee that in the next four to six weeks. Um, that transfer we did, how long did that last? So we we worked with CMRPC to make that last to the end of the fiscal year. Really? So, you know, if we're able to hire faster than that, we could probably move okay. more of Ian's time up front. Okay. That's the that's what I'm hoping for. Now, Ian is also going to participate with us prior to the new hire and after the new hire in 
redesigning or at least revisiting the processes and the procedures of that department so that we all have a comfort level with how it's supposed to run you know, from the time that an applicant first raises their hand and says, I want to be considered to the point where they're approved, are we really being as user friendly as we could be? Who so makes that, that hire? That is a department head, so I make the appointment, but the Board of Selectmen ratifies it. They have 21 days. It's one of those things, right? It's a negative vote. They have 21 days to reject my appointment. <laughs> it becomes an appointment if they don't act but they may act earlier if they want to approve. But the way I like to do business is I like to have them approve it just so we can, so the building commissioner, they did. The public safety chief contracts that were just posted, they, they declined to act, but the 21 days ran pretty quickly anyway, so those, all those contracts and appointments are effective. It so. ran in 21 days. Yeah. So police and fire chief okay. have effective contracts the next three years. I think I asked you in the last couple of days via email, can you get me the letter from the previous? So I can't. Um, and it was, it took a, a couple of cups of coffee for me to remember this. It's a personnel record. And if it was not addressed to you, you don't have access to it. Um, that's Attorney Mazur's advice. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, Who's Attorney Mazur? Our labor council from Copperman and Page. <laughs> 300 bucks an hour. But he only took him a nanosecond to answer my question. I'm sure. <laughs> oh. All right. And uh, so you need a reserve fund transfer of $2,000 amount requested tonight, Jean? That's correct. So I would entertain a motion to approve that transfer. So moved. Okay. Heather's motion? Second. Dick's second. So let's have a roll call vote to approve that. Uh, from uh, Carol? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Mike, it's Mike. Yeah, that's Are there three Carols? <laughs> <laughs> We got a lot of echo on you, Carol. Okay. Uh, so Carol votes three times yes. Much <laughs> Emphatically. All right. I vote once, yes. Okay, great. I vote yes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Dick Vandenberg, yes. Okay. Heather Morin, yes. Howard D'Amico, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, is that does that work, Gene? Yeah, okay. All right. I'll have the members here. Yeah. So what do we have? Two, four, six. Is there like a job grade for these new positions going on? Is there a class or coding? So when I post, you have to post the salary that you're asking people to come get. Can you hear me now, Carol? Is that better? You can nod. <laughs> Maybe not. I can hear myself better without the mask. Um, this is a thick mask. The community development director position, when Mr. Cundiff was there, he was at the top step of grade M5, which is our highest management Great, so M5 step 10, which last year. Matt, speak into the mic. Look, there's signage. Hold on, put it back up, Carol. Go on, put it back up. Yeah, but I'm, I, I can't speak any louder than this. Well, look, I can't, I've got to address my member. I, I'm going to hold up my own side, which is turn up your speakers. Because at this point, that's the only thing it could be. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to hurt everybody's ears here if I shout any louder. Where was I? So that was an M5, step 10. There is a, an educational difference between an engineer and a certified planner. There's just that academic credential. <clears throat> so I've set the range DQE, so depending on qualifications, or DOQ, qualifications and experience. 
I might start this person at the grade lower, M4, step five, if they have sufficient experience. If they're an engineer and they come to us, I might start them as an M5, but at a slightly lower step. So I think I, what I offered in the advertisement was between 77 and 83. Okay. So that's a good, uh, you know, it could be nineteen, twenty-five thousand dollars less than the incumbent earned. And the decision of what to do with those funds, if I had my druthers at the moment, I think we need the admin support maybe to go, you know, part-time to supplement that ramp-up time. Um, but I'm not going to prejudge what I might get for candidates. So, um, again, the authorization here is in the Town Administrator Act. I can only do this temporarily. So the next time we have a town meeting, I have to ask town meeting to reset the personnel table, the compensation table, so that the title is in the grade. Um, and we've done that a couple times in the last couple years, but that will have to happen here. Uh, the other position is Suzanne's. The Board of Selectmen and I agreed that this position, that that position, Suzanne Kane's position, to date she's been an OA-5, which is the highest office as, uh, administrative assistant grade that we have, OA-5, step 10, because she's been here for so long. Our view as a group is that this needs to be a management this is, uh, position based on what the functions of the job are, and they meet the qualifications under the Fair Labor Standards Act and Department of Labor guidance on an exempt position, namely that the individual doesn't have to manage other people. They need to manage critical assets, be able to take independent initiative, and probably the most important or obvious is that access to and management of confidential information. The assistant to the Board of Selectmen and the town administrator often has all the passwords, all of our network, uh, computer network, rebooting process and security uh, procedures, controls the security of this building, so all the accounts for the locks and the doors and all the rest of it, and all the executive session minutes. So all the litigation, the personnel records, and everything that goes along with the post. It's my view that I think this position, that person needs to be on task when the task presents itself and not tied to 40 hours. We cannot, as a town, afford to pay overtime to this position. It would, it would be a significant and obvious amount of money in the budget if the person who works in Suzanne's job were paid overtime. Suzanne gets by because, A, she's very good. Secondly, she's got a lot of experience. So she knows, it's not cutting corners, she knows where the fat is and where the meat is, and she just focuses on what's product of activity. Somebody who's new is going to have to learn some of those ropes no matter how hard we, tr we try to drain them. So there's going to be that period of time where somebody's going to take 50 hours a week to learn the job. I, I don't know that I want to pay for the training. I want to pay for the skills and, and the work to get done. So that's where we are with the posting and the philosophy on that. So what would that be? That would be like an M2 as opposed to an OA5. Again, on a temporary basis, pending town meeting approval. I really, so the, the range of experience somebody could have might really vary here, so I would like to have the flexibility to establish that. I don't think it would be step one or two. I think it would be closer to three or four or five. So I just have a question. So it, when we're talking about like the former position of the town engineer, is it better in the long run to, I just want to ask, to start them at an M4 because then their range can't go as high? Is that how that works? Like, an, does an M5, is, 5 is that range, does it go higher because it's an M5? It does. I don't have the chart right in front of me. It's not a huge, huge, huge difference. It's a bigger difference at the more junior steps than I think it is in the final step. Um, it's really, it, there it's really about the credential and what the expectations are of, of how much initiative an engineer with a, a stamp can take versus uh, 
a certified planner would be able to take on the same matter. Um, it's also, let's face it, it's about competition, right? So planners are being hired at sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Some places that they have a lot of experience, they might command eighty or slightly more than eighty, depending on the size of the community. I don't think we have an armadillo's chance on a hot Texas highway of getting an engineer for that money. If that's the de decision that the town wants to make, it would be probably going to be in the 90s to get that person just to sign up. This is a tough one because we're in the market for a specific, more of a specific work ethic and demonstrated record and knowledge of processes and procedures that doesn't show up on a resume. And so the interview process is going to be hugely important here. I'm much more concerned with making the right hire than being overly wedded to this salary or that salary. Um, I have, we've all made mistakes in our career. The one tremendously horrible hire that I made that I regret to this day is I hired the wrong person to be a planner. And they didn't, that person didn't get along with, with his board, didn't get along with his colleagues, and, and put me in a really bad spot for the better part of a year and a half just trying to defend the performance of somebody I picked. And, I just don't want to ever do that again. I'm going to be extra careful. Uh, land use is a huge issue in a small town. It has to be the right dynamic for people to be comfortable. And then I had another question about a previous meeting where did we mentioned um, the town of Uxbridge was also looking for a plan. Was that a couple towns going in on you? So they're still posted. Um, but that was a couple towns. Uh, to one? Uxbridge, Minden, and Millville. So they're looking for one person for those three towns? Yeah. Okay, we're <laughs> enough work for one person for one small town? Um, this future growth is probably in that projection, too, of what's future. I mean, right, so I mean, so Oxford is fairly large, Menden is large. I mean, that's. They're large, and I'm sure they're... Well, we're bigger than men, but I, to be perfectly blunt, that job posting is a laughing joke. Okay. All right. There, Oxbridge is a, a pretty substantial town yes. with a very active planning board. Anybody who thinks that they can split their time between Oxbridge and the smaller communities, and Millville isn't exactly the most peaceful place on the planet. I think they've come around a little bit. Things have gotten a little bit better, but it's a that's a huge job. That is not a one-person job, and they're... They're smoking some really good stuff. They should pass it around to think they're going to get somebody to do that job for 75. It seems like you have a conflict of interest to me. Well, <laughs> one person looking so at projects for three different towns under one salary. Yeah, so right. where is their thought process going? And we seem to be going in a different... So that's what I'm kind of... Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll tell you, you know, if you look around us... Mm -hmm. um, the town of Sutton has a very accomplished and, and fairly well-known town planner and director of economic development. She's been there a long time. She has a wonderful job. She's not an engineer, first of all. Um, but she's got more than enough to do with just the town of Sutton. And other towns of similar size feel the same way. I, I just, unfortunately for our friends in Uxbridge, they, they try really hard to regionalize all the things that I don't want to regionalize. And they don't work with us to regionalize the stuff that I think we could have regionalized. It's just... We're not on the same wavelength with it. But this, the, to do that job, just think about it. You've got three planning boards. They are all going to expect you to be there. You're going to sign up for a job where you're more or less guaranteed to be out three nights a week, every other week, and do all those plan reviews and do all that stuff and file everything on time. Because if you don't file right, if you don't put the comments in, there's a constructive approval, there's all these horrible things that can happen. It's a really tough job. And God bless anybody who applies for it. They're probably either naive or desperate. I hate to be that blunt, but I think that's a, a failure. I know that here. Bear in mind, it's not just the planning board, okay? Um, the director of community development works closely with me on grant applications and securing all of the activity set that goes behind that, not just filing the application and saying yes to the money, but the actual implementation of the grant, the documentation of our efforts, the um, identification of grant opportunities if we haven't applied for them in the past, right? Keeping all that straight and then working with building facilities as part of the procurement and capital improvement process. That was another thing that Bill did that is also part of the job. 
So it's not just the planning board. There's there's a fair number of of boards and commissions that he supported either directly or indirectly through his activities. That's not immediately obvious. Are you saying that the job description you're looking for would include a economic development component? No. Okay. All right. No, that component we broke out yeah. and hired a part-time person because that work is ongoing. So we've we've hit the ground running with that. So <clears throat> our expression of interest for economic development grant process, that's the initial step on the so-called one-stop website, you know, we're sitting there filling in these fillable forms. Uh, Bob is taking care of all of that. He started a MassWorks grant application and he's shepherding these big projects through. We had a tech review meeting in here yesterday morning where we went through uh, all of the conceptual plan sets for the marijuana retail on the Webster border as well as a growth facility on Davis Street. The applicant walked out after an hour feeling very helped like they were oriented to how the town works. We had everybody here, all the department heads. It was a good session. So I, I think he's done a, a fair good good job so far. Now, what's our current population? So the, I think the town clerk gets about 8,700 responses to her census, which I think is an impressive response. But I would be a monkey's uncle if that's everybody. A lot of people don't comply, right? They don't have a dog license or anything else, they're not sending the thing back. I bet that the town and with the North Village construction and the speed with which they've sold, it, we're over 9,000. I would be very surprised if we're not over 9,000. Do you see new economic development as you hit that marker of 10? No, oh, I think you're going to be 10,000 faster than you can shake a stick. It'll be the fastest population growth in Douglas for for a long time. In the next two or three years? Four to five years, yeah. But at 10, do you then see uh, economic development growth once you hit a, a marker of 10,000? You might, because it all depends. Everybody, everybody being the corporate world, has a different way of measuring where they want to be. Some will use traffic counts, some will use rooftops, some will use population, right? Target group population. I think it won't so much be a population-driven economic development as it is economic change is driving the interest in Douglas. So the more we go to this clicks and mortar method of buying stuff that we want, the distribution network has to be built out to support the amount of a volume that's being moved through those channels. And that that's a national trend, right? So just about everywhere where there's greenfield opportunity near a major interstate highway, there's a lot of interest in the property on both sides of it, within a mile of it, because that's the only efficient way to move all those goods and get them to our households. So that trend will continue, and that is primarily what's feeding us. What are the other two the two things that are feeding us? The inevitable rise, <laughs> and it's not going away, it's only going to get bigger and more sophisticated, of solar energy as our primary means of producing renewable energy. And the new miracle Massachusetts industry of cannabis. And we are actually participating very effectively in all three of those things. For a small town to get economic development, you identify what's growing and you go there. Because you're not the idea that we're going to have a, we're going to build rocket ship parts. Well, maybe we would, but that's because some local person has extraordinary talent and decides to be here, but it's not because of what's going on in the economy in general. Where are we with development of this long-discussed uh, warehousing or uh, national? So there are two. I'll be as concise as I can. There are two proposals. One is on the Uxbridge side of 146 on Lackey Dam Road. So you see the, there's a for sale sign out there. Um, that building will straddle three towns, Douglas, Uxbridge, and Sutton, with the only a minority of it, very small minority of it being in Douglas. It just happens that our little triangle of our town cuts the building in half, right? So we're involved in, in, in every aspect of it. That is being built on speculation. It's very far down the permitting path. So they've done MEPA review. 
They're doing very expensive traffic studies, very expensive stormwater studies. It's highly unusual for any private sector entity to spend that much money on a development project and not build it. So I would say right now I'm 75% sure, unless lightning strikes one of the principles of the investment company, that that warehouse is going to be built. That's 646,000 square feet. Um, the three planning boards, the three, three towns are having joint meetings every other week. This is the week. So Thursday night will be, I think, the third meeting of the three planning boards. So if you want to tune in, it's time limited to two hours. Most of the meat of the discussion is the first hour and a half. What is our, inter what is our percentage interest in that project? I, I've identified two things that... It, 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 call it 7%, right? If you just want to go on a per square foot yeah. basis of the building. Yeah. Okay. But I think Douglas has two primary interests in this conversation. Three, actually. One is make sure that the all three towns have a different way of assessing property, right? One has a town assessor, the other has a board appointed by the town manager, and ours is elected. We need agreement on getting a professional commercial real estate appraiser to inform the value because it's not a, this isn't a local business where we're going to sell pizzas. This is a national, possibly multinational company building a necessary asset. They're much more likely to have, accept a high value than a local business person would be. So I've got appraisers whispering this in my ear, make sure you get this value right because you don't want to end up with the BJ's warehouse problem that Uxbridge had where they undervalued it significantly and then tried to recoup and too late, right? That, so it's the assessed value. Secondly is the water connection. We really would like them to be our customer because it justifies the grant application for the extension and improvement of the line from the North Street Bridge all the way across the highway, which opens up development possibilities on both sides of, of the road. And the third interest is traffic. Uh, and this is the last meeting got a little bit, I don't want to say contentious, but clearly the, our local boards have all settled on the deficiencies, frankly, of the VHB traffic study. Because their analysts tried to say half and half, right? I don't know if it's going to be a tractor trailer distribution center or a fulfillment center. So I split the difference. Eh, wrong answer, right? Because you're either going to have a couple hundred tractor trailers a day, or you're going to have several hundred vans. And the way that affects the traffic in, in East Douglas, really different. So I, we're trying to pin them down. So they're building it on spec. They don't have a perfect answer for us, but they're going to have to decide somehow what they're going to do with this thing and tell us. So that's proposal number one, pretty much squared away. The proposal that is all in Douglas, a million square foot warehouse in a retired, spent out sand and gravel pit with uh, uh, an earth removal permit that's no longer active. Well, it might be active, but it's not really, he's not digging in there anymore. Is this at the same intersection? A um, quarter of a mile away. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of traffic coming together all at once there. It's going to be a busy, a very busy place. Not going to look anything like today. Okay. That one. To make a long story short, there are a number of contingent real estate deals that are like dominoes. And, and the purchase and sales agreement for each and every one of those dominoes has been negotiated and is in place. The ultimate mover, the one who knocks over the first domino, is the current occupant of the sand and gravel pit. And he's before the planning board for a special permit to move his business to another location in Douglas. That's a win, by the way. Yeah, sure. So, but he needs to vacate where he is so that it opens up the property for the developer to not only buy that property, but to buy the town property that we were at town meeting asking for permission to sell, the 17.7 acres, right? Once he's able to move, the other three purchase and sales agreements will probably all close in the same day, in the same building, with different conference rooms, with people walking around with big fancy checks and handing them off to each other. Because you have an, a, a conglomerator, somebody who's pulling the land together, who is in the transaction, who is going to sell it to a developer who eventually will sell it to the end user. 
I am told that as soon as that first domino falls, we will sit down with the end user because the end user is identified, but they won't tell us, which you know frustrates everybody. But um, end user for what? For the warehouse, for a million square foot warehouse. Distribution center again. Again, is it a distribution center or is it a last mile fulfillment? Okay. From the pictures that I've been shown, the conceptual drawings, I would say it's a tractor trailer distribution okay. center. The, the Timeline, uh, first trailer going up and down the ramp. Oh boy. Just ballpark. Uh, the Tritown project wants to be in the ground by May and, and, and operating by late fall or early next spring. Our, our thing uh, is talking about, you know, these tilt construction. You know, they pour the concrete in place, they tilt the wall up, they move on, they tilt the next wall up, they go up really fast. If anybody watched the Amazon place in Fall River go up, it went up in like a month. It was ridiculous how fast. So it's really just, the ground is perfectly prepared. It's an old sand and gravel pit, right? So it's flat, and there's not a lot of features there, not a lot of boulders, don't need to blast anything, you're just gonna get going. So I'm, I'm just want to see the timing on it. So where are we as a town? We've asked the water and the water commissioners to make a commitment for money for engineering up front that may be paid back either through a TIF or some other arrangement, or maybe the developer will front the money and we'll pay them back through a TIF, okay? But we have to do that field surveying and have the project shovel ready for a MassWorks grant to be successful. If it's not ready for construction, they won't fund it. So it, it becomes a little bit, I don't want to say hairy, but it's driven by the pace. If they, if we want to file a MassWorks application in a timely fashion in August, all that surveying and Pre preliminary engineering needs to be done by June so you can see where we are. It's tight. But it's, it's March. Where's the current user in terms of the timing of their closing on their acquisition of their replacement facility? So it's in front of our planning board. Bear with me. What does that mean? Um, so to have an open air uh, processing facility in town. Yeah. You, if you recall, there was a town meeting where we came to town meeting and asked for an addition to the zoning use table for manufacturing outdoors. Yeah. That's what that's about. Yeah. So that requires a special permit now yeah. from the planning board. Yeah. So that application's been filed with the planning board. It depends how fast they can move on it. Is that a two week or six month process? It's going to depend on what questions they have and, and how much they want to push it. I, I, I should think you'd be able to do that in two months, you know, here at one meeting, dispose of it the next meeting. Is that the last major town hurdle to that acquisition? Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's the first domino. Yep. Okay. And being mindful of the future, we're asking that the road that grants access for the new site be built to our industrial park standards so that if we ever open up land in the back, yeah. the road will be there to start that process. Mm -hmm. So, Will water have to be brought out to that project? <laughs> in an ideal world, yes. I mean, this is a much more difficult sell. We've always envisioned, we've always wanted serious discussion about cannabis growth facilities on the end of Davis Street or anybody else who would use a lot of water just to justify moving that pipe out there. That is the goal, right? The goal is to get water and sewer up there so that you can, it won't be totally pad ready because you won't have natural gas, but if you have water and sewer and you have lots that are big enough, I think people will still buy them. They're too close to the highway, they're too attractive. We are in the process of all that backland of pursuing God knows how many heirs of deceased people who died in intestate back in the 1700s and, you know, yeah. This is real, 
This is the real thing. It's real economic development. Uh, so you said there's a two hour time limit on these meetings. <laughs> so one thing I can administrator update or you have something else you want to update us to in the next 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, how about two minutes? Go. We had a board meeting today for health insurance. And, um, board of Selectmen meeting? No, board meeting. Board of the Massachusetts Strategic Health oh. Group. So the, the two town administrators and the business manager of the <clears throat> Dudley Charlton School District or the board. Um, we've, we've had a real rough year claims wise. But we had so much surplus built up from our town of Douglas last year. The question is going to come down to how do we want to smooth this out? So if the underwriter is being very cautious and saying you should probably, Douglas should look at a 10 to 11 percent increase in the working rate, but we have so much surplus and plus our equity buy-in, and I haven't even really had to sit down with Gene, so I'm going to just say what I, what my view is. My view is we should try to absorb as much as our budget allows this year so we don't have an, a second year of potential big increase next year. So that's like so, going into your budget discussion before we see a budget? So you don't get ahead of me. Don't get ahead of me. No, no, you, you, you made it three. You just made it three. <laughs> it's a reverse auction, Mr. Chairman. The more you talk, the longer it'll take. I'm trying here. I'm trying to respect your desire for concise presentation. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking maybe a six, maybe a seven is where we should go, which means we're built in for a three next year. But that, to me, seems like a wise use of our surplus and our retained earnings in the trust fund to smooth this out and not do the political thing. The political thing is, well, let's give ourselves a zero. And everybody who does that ruins the arrangement, right? We want to be prudent about it. So that's the, the development that's just this afternoon. We had a lot of people remote tonight, so I feel a little bit bad because typically a lot of these people come and participate in person. I've got a quick, I've got the front part of the budget. So what are the assumptions I, am I using right now? Uh, are, uh, and rather than pass it around, speak to it, I'll speak to it, and you can take it as you leave, and I'll, I'll email it to the other members of the FinCom. So we're thinking about a 6%. On the COLAs for our labor unions, I, I, I have them in my model. Our bargaining position is in the model. We're not changing our split. So we're in 80-20, which still makes us one of the most generous towns anywhere in the Commonwealth in terms of the, the premium for health insurance. <sighs> BVT's number came in at 11.122. I don't know where he does his math. I think I'm better at math than he is, I guess. Um, but we had the same number, right? 1539389. That is his number. That's why I got this was like that. He might argue that he's better at math yes. because his math presents a lower number. Who was it? Was it George Bush Sr. or George Bush Jr. that talked about fuzzy math? Yeah. yeah. It, this is pretty straightforward. This is a calculation. I was already there with you. I just like <laughs> to argue the point because, yeah. So that puts us where it puts us. And with, you know, I, I give our schools for now anyway, the opening position is a one and a half. So if okay. they're a one and a half, he's at 11.1. And what well, fairness to him, that is a number based on an increase in students as well. Yeah. Right. But it's also, I mean, it's our numbers. Yeah. I guess. It's a, yeah. it's an almost a doubling of his enrollment from Douglas. And it, you, everybody can have their own. Yeah, you have your own I litmus test. You, you can all have your own litmus test. I am very cynical. I don't think anything happens by mistake. I think every time we vote this guy's budget down, he finds another way to get 12 more Douglas kids into his school. But that's just me being a jerk. School bus transportation is down year over year. And this is something I wanted to broach with both you as the FinCom and with the Board of Selectmen. I do not want to budget against that. In other words, I want to end up with a surplus that's 
roughly the size of this uh, of this decrease in the school bus contract because this COVID thing has changed the way we operate with the bus company. Not really the bus company, but I think special education transportation is where the change is occurring. You cannot count on that. Do not spend that money. It will be back next year. So just make believe. Put it into something like OPEB or Rhodes or something, a one-time shot because you know you have to raise an appropriate because it's going to be right back in the budget next year as part of the budget, uh, as part of the school bus costs. So at our present time, we're talking about watching sausage being made. I'm currently at a $105,000 surplus where I am with the budget now. I have got a couple of ticket. I've got to put the economic development position in there. And that's going to soak up some of that. And I have to make a final decision what I'm going to do about uh, some of the smaller vehicles that have been requested by the department heads that won't be funded by the capital committee. So <clears throat> that might soak up some of that. That's a one-time thing. That is where I am with the budget. I have. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to hold my feet to the fire. I have to have a deadline to make myself sweat. I will publish a budget to you by Friday at noon. Deal. That is good enough to look at this Friday. Good enough to look at. Part of the problem here is we have transitioned from Google to Microsoft. And I thought I was going to have time to do this and then post it to a really easy to use platform. Nonsense. We have been down the rabbit hole with the stinking Microsoft people. And then so we can talk about that document in two weeks. Yes. Right? When we'll all have it in front of us. Yep. Okay. All right. I also, to humor, not humor anybody, I think these are great charts. They're right. very helpful. Is your time up? Chart, nope. Is the five minutes expired? We're going to do it. The Constitutional Convention. Did you know this story? Oh. What do you get? In the 1980 Constitutional Convention in Rhode Island, they actually they got up, they climbed up to the, the balcony of the State House and held the clock so that it wouldn't strike midnight until they were finished their business. Pretty cool story. So this is a chart that Dick asked for this kind of chart. I thought the most interesting chart I could think of would be our energy spend. How are we doing? We're in this green community thing. Are we doing okay? We should see our electricity and our heating fuel expenses go down because we should be using less and prices have been relatively stable. They're not going to be stable going forward. But so that that's actually the story. Um, but I can we can make any chart you want in about ten seconds because it's a matter of copying the series from Excel, putting it into PowerPoint and producing it. Sure so the snow and ice budget over the last ten years. <laughs> <laughs> it goes with the weather. Even Look, this is a uh, uh, this this is a finesse school uh, snow and ice. We just we asked for another seventy five. I think you know that. So we've well, deficit because, spent. Look, you're on snow and ice. Up now, I'm moving right along. I don't know where you are. I'm, gonna, I'm at three minutes. <laughs> another seventy five right. because that long duration storm required us to do that. Okay. But it's not going to snow again, so that's all you need, right? I did say that. I did I put my snowblower away. Okay, I've got the lawnmower out. All right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, let's move on. Yeah, when, when John runs out of energy at 3 o'clock in the morning, we know who's going to drive the truck the rest of the night. <laughs> so, for two weeks from tonight, we have the Douglas Public School Committee, or School Board, or School Department, and do we have the fire department? And capital. And capital. Okay. It's a very long night. Well, mm -hmm. let's see. Fire department. Pretty straightforward. Okay. All right. Anything else? Jean, anything else? Anyone else? Anything else? Heather, do you have any thoughts on a motion? I do. Sandy? Make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Sandy, motion to adjourn. I'll second it. Dick, second. Hey, thanks, man. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We're adjourned. <laughs>